Today I'm going to talk about documentation, coding guidelines and code formatting. And I'm going to fix two bugs I ran into while writing code for the coming videos. I will end up with four new commits and for each one I will follow the workflow I laid out in the last video where I create a new branch, commit, push to GitHub and open a pull request. I will go through all of this pretty quickly, but all of the code and changes are available on GitHub so have a look there to study them in detail. So beginning with the documentation, in this project I'm keeping things rather simple when it comes to documentation. The main bulk of it will be in the readme file and I think having a readme file with the most important instructions is the bare minimum for any project and that's also what's most helpful for someone new to the project. And what I include in this readme is basically just a summary of all of the things that I've talked about in the previous videos. That is a small introduction to the project, uh, describe the directory structure, how to set up and build the project, uh, the workflow and so on. Note at the moment this readme is a bit ahead of the implementation because I've written down instructions for things that I will implement in the coming videos so just be aware of that if you have a look at it now. Anyway, besides the readme, I also created a separate document to describe the coding guidelines I'm following in this project. These are practices or patterns that I adhere to when I write C code. I have a good reason for some of these practices, but others are just also based on my personal preference. But if you see me write some quirky C code in the coming videos that you don't recognize, I most likely describe it in this document. And if not, please leave a comment on the video because I will keep on adding stuff to this document throughout the video series. It's perhaps not super important to have a document like this when I'm the only one working on the project. I decide how the code is written and nobody questions me. It's more useful when collaborating with other developers because then there will be different opinions about how to do things and in those cases you need to settle on a set of coding guidelines to avoid silly discussions during code reviews and then it's very nice to have a document like this to point to. As a side note, I also added two files to git ignore. These are files that get generated when I run something called beer to generate a compilation database used to provide me features like linting, autocompletion, diagnostics in my editor Vim, which is not relevant unless you have the same setup as me. Once I had made these changes, I created a new commit, wrote a descriptive commit message and pushed it to GitHub. And with a local branch push, I opened a pull request and let the CS system I set up in the last video run, which I expected to succeed since I hadn't made any changes to the code. I could then merge the pull request onto the main branch. Simple enough, the first out of four commits done, moving on to the next one. Related to the coding guidelines is the formatting of the code, or in other words how the code is indented, two or four spaces or tabs, or whether the braces should be on the same or a separate line, that boring stuff that you don't even want to think about. And the good thing about this is that most of it can be automated, and I use an auto formatter called Clang Format for this. This is the formatter for C and C++ built upon Clang, part of the LLVM project. It's a widely used formatter, readily available in Ubuntu standard repository, and I'm using version 12. It's easy to use, you just need a configuration file in the root directory describing the rules of the coding style. I think I've already mentioned this file in an earlier video because I had already added it to the repository. With this config file in place, formatting a file is just a matter of running Clang format dash i on a file. Dash i tells Clang format to overwrite or format the file in place. But running it like this is a bit cumbersome if you have many files or when you keep on adding more files to the project. So I also decided to add it to my make file so I could run a simple command from the command line to format all source files in one go. But first I had to create a new local branch and since I hadn't merged the last commit to the main branch, I had to locally fetch and check out the latest remote again. I then went ahead with adding the formatting rule to my make file and mark it as phony since it uh, doesn't produce any output. And apart from making it easy to run from the command line, this rule also made it possible for me to add it to my CF system. And adding it there would protect me against merging unformatted code to my main branch. But it was not just enough to add this command to the configuration file for the GitHub action. I also had to update the Docker image, which I created in the last video because it didn't include Clang format. To update the Docker image, I updated the Docker file and then went through the same steps as in the last video. And I'm not including them in this video so please look at the last video if you are interested. Clang format as is doesn't return an error if there is unformatted code, so to have the CS system fail if there is, I use git diff, and that's why I also made git part of the docker file before. So with this change, now the CS system first checks formatting, then runs static analysis and finally builds the project. So these are three checks each commit must pass before they can be merged. I could then commit the change, write a commit message and push it to GitHub, open a pull request and make sure the new steps were executed.
And just to show you how it works locally, I can modify file, git if then returns an error. And if I format the files, it should remove the differences and git if should return OK or zero, which it does. I could then go ahead and merge the pull request. Two out of four commits are done. Now to the two bugs I ran into, but first a fresh local branch. The first issue I ran into was that make didn't rebuild the project when I modified uh, header files. And that's kind of the point with make that it should detect uh, when a change occurs and then rebuild the necessary parts of the project. But in my case, it didn't notice this if what I modified was a header file. For example, if I modified i squared c dot h with something that should give a compilation error and then ran make, it said that the executable was already up to date. I had to first clean the project and then run make to notice the compilation error. The problem was that the rule I created for building the project didn't include the header files as dependencies, but only included the implementation files, the C files. The solution was simple, I just had to include the header files as part of the dependencies. As usually, I couldn't keep myself from simplifying things a bit while at it. I reworked the variables holding the files into a very variable to first hold all C files with corresponding header files. And then a second variable with all the C files. And then I could use the first variable to get the corresponding header files by replacing the suffix. And finally I added this variable with the headers to the dependencies. I also added the headers to the formatting rules, since these should also be formatted. Then if I did the same thing again and modified the header file and ran make again, make detected the modified file and rebuild the project and I could see the compilation error. Good. So commit and push again. Open a pull request, CI passed, and then I merged the pull request. Three out of four commits done. Last bug. This last bug or issue had to do with static analysis, which I set up in a previous video. Similar to formatting, I have a rule in my make file to run static analysis on all files in one go. And similarly, it's also part of the CI flow. At the time I added it, it ran instantly, as expected, but as I began adding more code, it suddenly began taking a very long time, much longer than it should given the small amount of code I added. So I had to revert my changes to track down the reason it was taking so long, and the problem was the file msp430, the header file from the Wender TI. Apparently CPP shake can become slow like this when analyzing files with a lot of if defs, and boy does this file have a lot of them. It's not really necessary to analyze this file since I don't intend to change it and I trust that it's correct. So I just removed it from the list of files CPP was checking. While at it, I of course also couldn't help myself from reworking things in the make file. I split up the CPP shake recipe into multiple variables and rerunning make CPP shake, it then ran quickly again. But now I instead got a new warning about the file I had just excluded. To remove this warning, I just added another suppression to avoid warnings about system header files. I also got another warning about unmatched suppressions when I reverted my changes, so I also added a suppression for that as well. And finally, a third suppression for unused functions, since I will introduce some unused functions in the coming videos, and I don't want CPP check to complain about them. The compiler will catch those if they are part of the build anyway. And once again, committing the changes and writing a commit message. Or there was one more small thing I want to fix, because I noticed that make clean gave an error if I ran it twice, because it expects the build folder to exist, so I added the dash f flag to avoid that error. And then I could push the commit to GitHub. Open a pull request and making sure everything ran okay. before finally merging the pull request. Now the project was in a good state to finally start writing code, which I will do in the next video. Thank you for watching.